I'm Amber Harper from the Burned In Teacher Podcast and a part of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to now. Shows on the network are individually owned and opinions expressed may not reflect others. Find other interesting education podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. Support for House of Ed Tech comes from eSpark Learning. eSpark helps teachers save time by giving you online resources for your small groups and centers based on the standard you're teaching each week. Coming up on this episode of the House of EdTech podcast, we're going to talk about, is it the same old song? I've got a quick and easy SEL resource. And we're going to talk about how to increase student engagement. Strike up the band. Welcome to the House of EdTech podcast. I am your host, Chris Nessie. The House of Ed Tech explores how technology is changing the way teachers teach and the impact that technology is having in education. I discuss technology that is changing our classrooms and schools, and I share tools and tips that you can hear today and use tomorrow. You're going to hear the stories of teachers, leaders, and creators just like you. The purpose? Whether you use it or not, technology is changing the way you teach and how your students learn. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good generic time of the day to you. Thanks for making House of Ed Tech a part of your anytime, anywhere professional development. If you are a returning listener, welcome back. If you're brand new, welcome aboard. This is the podcast that you want to be listening to right now. Sure, you could have chosen any one of over a million, but I got you right here, right now. Got a great episode planned for you today. As the school year is in full swing, fall is in the air, pumpkin spice this, and well, there's a whole lot of pumpkins everywhere now, isn't there? (laughs) Glad you're here. Let's get into a couple of news and housekeeping items here at the top of the episode. First, I want to give a big shout out to Mr. Dan Hacker, who I've recently connected with via Clubhouse. So shout out to you, Dan, for listening to my content about the House of EdTech podcast not about the podcast, you listen to the podcast, but thank you for listening about the content about Clubhouse and reaching out to me and connecting. So I'm always looking to connect with new people and I'm looking forward to connecting with you even further. And if you're not on Clubhouse, you should get there. Go check it out. It's a lot of fun. Also, as I mentioned in episode 186, here's your basically from now until it happens reminder that the 2021 House of EdTech App Smackdown is coming. And I want you to share your favorite EdTech tool or tip from the last year. How did you use it? What did your students think of it? What do you think of the tool? Or what is your best EdTech tip? Give us all the details so we can help everybody with a great tool or tip, and they're going to get some value. This year's Smackdown is going to be episode 193, and that is going to be released on December 26th, 2021. I need your submission by December 18th. So get that to me. I recommend you get it done as soon as possible so you don't forget. I would hate for the episode to drop and you go, oh my goodness, I should have sent them something. I wanted to send them something. Oh man, now I got to wait till 2022. No, you don't. Get it done now. Go to chrisnessy.com slash feedback and you can send an email or click the button on the right-hand side of any part of the website, and you could send a voicemail. And if you're curious to see what kind of things have been recommended in the past, go to chrisnessy.com slash all-time smackdown, and thank you to Derek Larson, great listener and former substitute co-host of the podcast, for compiling and maintaining that document. Also, I want to give a nice shout-out to Brian Carpenter, at Brian Carr on Twitter, and that's B-R-Y-O-N. C-A-R, for including his thoughts about episode 186 on his recent episode of his podcast, Fresh Air at Five, and I will link to Brian's Twitter and his podcast in the show notes out at chrisnessy.com slash 187, but last episode was all about uh, podcasting and using audio in schools, which I've talked about previously, but I thought it was time to talk about it again 
And I think I'm going to talk a little bit more about it in a few more future episodes because let's face it, podcasting is hot, hot, hot. So let's get you hot, hot, hot for podcasting. Huh? Maybe that could be the episode title. Hot, hot, hot for podcasting. All right. Stay tuned for that one. (laughs) All right. Let's get into this episode's ed tech thought recommendation and my featured content, which is all about student engagement. This episode's ed tech thought, I am asking a question. Have we not learned our lesson? I'm going to be honest. I'm frustrated. You might also be frustrated here in this school year, post pandemic, coming out of the pandemic. But I got to be honest, I am talking to many of my friends in education, and I myself am seeing a lot of things day to day and in education that just kind of make me scratch my head. And I wonder if, as educators, we have collectively missed the point or missed out on the opportunity of what education could be and how education could evolve here in 2021 and into 2022. We are almost 25 years into the 21st century, right? What are we doing? I know that we are trying as hard as we can, but teaching is not getting easier. And and make no mistake, I'm not expecting my job and my career to get easier. It's always going to pose its challenges. You face challenges. I face challenges. But we have a big systemic problem in what education looks like. I'm not going to share a lot of specific things that are frustrating me because that's not going to solve those problems. Me saying them out loud and sharing them with the world is not going to fix those problems because they are problems that in all honesty, I do not have the authority to fix, which is what makes them even more frustrating. You might agree. You might disagree. I don't know. Feel free to let me know, though, what you think in terms of did we miss out on certain opportunities to make changes in education? I mean, it shouldn't be that hard to make changes. But you and I both know education, for whatever reason, is slow to move forward. I mean, the reality is we still have classrooms here in 2021 that look like they are classrooms in 1921, 1951. You know, we we still have inequity in our schools. We still have students that are experiencing disadvantages and don't have the same opportunities as other students. A lot of educators talk a good game. A lot of educational leaders talk a good game. But where is the change? I'm just frustrated. I'm working hard every day. I'm going to continue to work hard every day. But it's frustrating and it's draining when I know I want to try things. And believe me, within my limits, I am trying things. And I'm sure that you are too. And if you're not, give it a shot. At this point, what have we got to lose, right? So I would encourage you, along with me, to continue doing these things, to continue to try, and where possible, make suggestions. Share your ideas. You never know. If we keep things in our head and we don't put the the problems out there to potential problem solvers, you know, then I think there's a saying that if you, if you don't ask, it's always no, right? Um, so that that's kind of where I'm at. And I just wanted to use this portion of the episode to kind of brain dump that out there. And I'm certainly open to continuing the dialogue and talking about this. So feel free to uh, start or continue the conversation via Twitter or email me feedback at chrisnessy.com. And together, you know, we are better. So we can certainly get through this, you and I, together. So let's continue the conversation. And uh, if, if I'm off base or if there is a, a perspective that I'm not totally seeing, please help me. I, I, I've helped you for 186 and now into 187 episodes. So certainly I, I welcome the feedback 
and the help for myself as well. And that's my EdTech thought. This episode's EdTech recommendation isn't so much a tech recommendation, although it is on a website, so I guess that makes it technology, right? So this comes to us from weareteachers.com, and this is free prompts for SEL for middle and high school students. I'm going to include a link to this very simply in the show notes out at chrisnessy.com slash 187 where you can get these 50 free SEL prompts for your middle and high school students. And while they're not clearly for elementary school students, I am sure some of these are appropriate for the K-5 classroom and can certainly be adapted and reworded for our younger learners. But just a couple of questions here that I will share from this page. Number one, when your homework gets hard for you, what do you do? Number two, What is the most fun part of school for you? Number three, let's pretend you become famous. What do you think you'd be known for? And number four, if you could make one rule that everyone in the world had to follow, what would it be and why? So I've looked at all 50 of these questions. I think they are fantastic. Certainly a way you could use it as a do now, or you have a free moment to just get the kids talking non-content related, and just kind of get them thinking, imagining, wondering, which is certainly very powerful and very helpful. You know, I think you might find this valuable in your school or your classroom. And again, I will include a link to this from weareteachers.com out in the show notes or in your podcatching app, chrisnessy.com slash 187. And that's my EdTech recommendation. For the majority of this episode, I want to focus on student engagement and how we can increase student engagement, things that we can consider when we are designing our lessons and how we can get students more involved behaviorally, emotionally, and of course, cognitively, right? I'll be honest, as I try to be every time you hear my voice, honestly, (laughs) student engagement is something that I think right now here in 2021, I'm struggling with. Do I have my students attention here one month into the school year? Yes. I'm dynamic. My student teacher has a personality. I have a personality. We are moving around the room. We are talking with our kids. We're implementing some SEL strategies as the ninth graders that we work with. You know, uh, many of them spent last year virtual the entire school year. Some did the hybrid learning in the spring in my district that was offered. And I think I mentioned it, whether it was, you know, here or on podcast PD recently, how my ninth graders and, and think of your own students using the same math formula, my ninth grade students, their last time that they were in school might have been seventh grade. But then in the last couple of weeks, I've seen on Twitter and Facebook and going around on social media, this image that when was their actual last normal school year? And for a ninth grader, that would be sixth grade. The last school year that from start to finish, they were in school and things were quote unquote, you can hopefully you can hear my air quotes, things were normal in education. And now they're in ninth grade and all, all the poo has hit the fan for some kids and in some classrooms. So there's certainly some struggle going on. And I feel like student engagement is low and I'm trying to figure out ways to get my students to invest in what's going on. So here are some things that I'm thinking about and things that you might find valuable as well. And before I get into it, If you have ideas in addition to these, please go to chrisnessy.com slash feedback, send me a message or DM me on Twitter and let me know what you're also thinking and what you're doing 
about student engagement. Now, when we think of student engagement in learning activities, it is often convenient to understand engagement with an activity being represented by good behavior, positive feelings, and above all, student thinking. This is because students may be behaviorally and or emotionally invested in a given activity without actually exerting the necessary mental effort to understand and master the knowledge, the craft, or the skill that the activity and the learning promotes. In light of this, we need to consider how following interrelated elements and designing and implementing learning activities can help increase our students' engagement in all of these areas. Again, behaviorally, emotionally, and how they're thinking and processing the learning. So here are six things to consider. Number one, make it meaningful. Number two, foster a sense of competence. Number three, provide autonomy, support. Number four, embrace collaborative learning. Number five, establish positive teacher-student relationships. And number six, promote mastery orientations. Now let's go into each one of these and let's start with our first one, making it meaningful. When you're aiming for full engagement, it's essential that students perceive activities as being meaningful and authentic. Research has shown that if students do not consider a learning activity worthy of their time and effort, they might not engage in a satisfactory way or they'll disengage entirely. We've all seen this. To ensure that activities are personally meaningful, we can, for example, try to connect what we're doing in the classroom to number one, students' previous knowledge, and number two, their experiences. I try to do this in social studies. I don't know what this looks like in other content areas. All I know is you typically hear students say, when am I ever going to need blank? Well, we need to be able to answer that question. Also, we need to be as teachers, the ones who can kind of model and demonstrate why what we're doing is worth pursuing. So if we want our students to be lifelong learners, we also need to demonstrate how we are lifelong learners and how we're using our learning and our pursuit of educational ideals personally. I do that. I try to. I talk with my students about things that I'm learning beyond teaching. I talk about podcasting. I talk about other things that I'm interested in and learning about and how I continue to learn and grow as a person. So I try to show them how I make learning meaningful to me at this stage of my life and how they can do it at the stage of life that they're at. Number two, foster a sense of competence. The notion of competence may be understood as a student's ongoing personal evaluation of whether they can succeed in a learning activity or a challenge. They're thinking, can I do this? Effectively performing an activity can positively impact subsequent engagement. Success breeds success. To strengthen our students' sense of competence in learning activities, assigned activities should and could do the following. Be only slightly beyond their current level. Number two, make the student demonstrate understanding throughout the activity. Number three, show peer coping models and peer mastery models. Show students who try and succeed at the activity. What does that look like? Think of it like each one teach one. And number four, include feedback that helps your students make progress. How do I try to do this in my classroom? I'm doing project-based learning. I'm doing DBQs. So everything that I'm asking my students to do, I have to provide them a lot of feedback. I have to conference with them one-on-one -on -one or in small group settings where I can go over with them what they're doing well and where they can improve so they understand the journey that they're on and how they can get from point A to point B and point C. And if they got to double back or, you know, how are they going to keep going through something? They need to understand and have that 
continuous feedback coming at them. So that's what I'm trying. Number three, provide autonomy support. We can look at autonomy support as nurturing the student's sense of control over their behaviors and their goals. When we relinquish control without losing power to the students, again, we are authority figures in our classrooms. When we do this, rather than promoting compliance, right, that's important, student engagement levels are probably going to increase. Autonomy support can be, can be implemented in a couple of ways. Number one, welcome your students' opinions and ideas into what you're doing in the classroom. Number two, using informational, non-controlling language with the students. If you or someone you know is still using the phrase, because I said so, you need to look in the mirror and reevaluate how you are managing and leading young people. And number three, giving the students the time they need to understand and absorb an activity by themselves. Yes, we have curriculums, we have our pacing guides, but we do need to make a conscious effort to provide students with time, with the content, the material, the activity. I would go so far as to say provide too much time and then through effective classroom management and additional opportunities, students who need the time will use the time and students who don't need all the time you provide, you can find other ways to, here you go, engage them and have them bring even more value to the class. It's all possible. Before we finish up with items four, five, and six, let's pause from a word from this episode's sponsor. With eSpark, join over 300,000 teachers and over 1 million students around the world using eSpark to help close the gap this school year. To help make the most of this school year, eSpark is giving you free access to eSpark for the 21-22 school year. With eSpark, you can identify learning gaps and monitor growth with email alerts and a variety of reports. eSpark provides small group resources leveled for your students. With standards-based games, videos, and digital activities, students work independently to succeed at their own level and their own pace, which can engage students and improve instructional outcomes. Once you sign up, you can get started in four easy steps. First, pick a math or reading standard. Number two, select your grade. Number three, pick groups in your class and select their learning levels. Step four, get leveled resources for your groups. Get started today for free by visiting chrisnessy.com slash eSpark. And thank you to eSpark for supporting the House of EdTech. So far, we have talked about making the learning meaningful, fostering a sense of competence for our students, and providing the autonomy support that they need. Number four, embrace collaborative learning. Collaborative learning is another powerful facilitator of engagement in learning activities. When students work effectively with others, and when they're learning how to work effectively with others, their engagement may be amplified as a result mostly due to experiencing a sense of connection to other people during these activities. And this is going to be very crucial to what I'm doing this year as students are returning from pandemic, virtual, hybrid, in-person, remote learning. All right. So connecting and helping them get reacclimated into what it means to collaborate and communicate with other people is very important. There's a lot of strategies that can be implemented to ensure that students know how to communicate and behave in this collaborative setting. We as teachers need to be modeling this. Modeling is a very effective method, meaning we need to show students how to collaborate or talk about how we collaborate with other people. With my ninth grade students, that's me talking about how 
I can produce podcasts with people who I do not work with and how I can interview people who are not in the same room with me or how I collaborate with my colleagues that I could see in the school building, but how we use the digital tools that they also have access to for collaboration. Now, when you're doing this, you know, we do want to avoid homogenous groups and, you know, grouping by ability, but we're at the start of the school year. You don't know your kids and it's going to take time to get those groups worked out. And sometimes you need to let the kids pick their own groups because that's what's going to make them most comfortable. It's kind of this area that I'm calling that exists, you know, this gray area, right? There's so much gray in our lives. I think there's something like 50 shades or something like that. So (laughs) we need to provide these environments for kids to be able to learn to collaborate and develop that skill. Again, I've talked about it when I talk about the four C's. Collaboration is one of the verbs of my classroom. I hope it's one of the verbs of your classroom as well. We need to foster individual accountability by assigning different roles. Don't just stick kids in a group and think that the work is magically going to get done. That doesn't teach them anything. Talk to them about choosing a project manager. Have them determine the roles they think they need if that's age appropriate. Or if you're just starting out and you have younger learners, you determine what roles should exist in a group. And then you talk to the kids about what these roles mean. And over the course of their time with you, they should experience all the roles that exist multiple times. That's going to teach them the skills they need. Number five, establish positive teacher-student relationships. High quality relationships with our students is another critical factor in student engagement, especially in the case of the difficult student and potentially those from even lower socioeconomic backgrounds. When students form close and caring relationships with their teachers, they are fulfilling their developmental need for a connection with others and a sense of belonging in society. Teacher-student relationships can be fostered in the following ways. Number one, care about your students' emotional needs. You're a human being. They're human beings. Care about them. Love on them. Show them you care. Number two, display positive attitudes and enthusiasm. Now, I will be honest, it is not all sunshine and rainbows. Sometimes I walk into the classroom and I will let them know, here's what's bothering me, and I will open up to them because life is not perfect and they honestly can't expect that I live a perfect life because I know that students don't live perfect lives. So honesty, a little authenticity goes a long way. Increase your one-on-one time with your students in your classroom. Take the time to get to know your kids. Have those one-on-one conversations with them. They will appreciate that. And again, we're in a time right now here in the fall of 2021 where our students need this. What else do they need? They need to be treated fairly. They need to be treated fairly. They need to be treated equitably. Not equally. There's a difference. Episode for another day. Treat your students equitably. Number four, sorry, one, two, three, four. Number five, avoid deception and breaking promises. Don't promise donuts or a pizza party if you're not going to deliver or if Domino's can't deliver. Don't lie to children. Goes back to what I previously said. Be authentic. Be honest. How do we expect them to learn how to do it if we're not modeling that? A lot of what we do comes down to how we act and who we are as people. So give that them give that some thought. And number six, promote mastery orientations. Finally, the student's perspective of learning activities also determines their level of engagement. When students pursue an activity because they want to learn and they want to understand, rather than merely obtain a good grade or look smart or make mommy and daddy happy or do better than the kids sitting next to them or behind them, their engagement is likely to be full and thorough. Dave Frangiosa, friend of Podcast PD, who I know through AJ Bianco, is very big into standards-based grading. I'll be honest, the more I think about it, I would love to just get rid of grades altogether. I'm not going to write a book about it. I'm not going to go traveling the world and speaking on stages about getting rid of grades. 
That's beyond my, my reach and my power. But what I do tell students point blank, whether it's at the high school level or the college level, that is, if you are only concerned about your grade, you are in a class or taking a class or your experience is going to be for the wrong reasons. I actually just had a funny ex- experience in one of my Rutgers classes where I work with seniors and a student was asking me about losing points on an assignment and everybody could kind of hear this conversation they, and it was okay that the conversation was could be heard by everybody and a student who I taught in a couple of other semesters basically chirped up from the back and said, if you start asking him about grades, he's going to get aggravated. Don't talk to grades. Don't talk to him about the grades. And uh, I said, thank you. And, I, and the person looked at me and said, why, why shouldn't I talk about my grade? I said, because it's not important. I said, as a college senior, even you should be at a stage of life where it's not about the grade, but about how you're going to grow as a person. And I just had a similar conversation with my high school freshman about don't worry about your grade, worry about doing the best you can and your grade will take care of itself. I think more people need to consider that approach and show kids that it's not just about the grade. Now, this is a lot about engagement. You might want to rewind, re-listen, slow it down, speed it up. I don't know what you need, but to recap, how can we increase student engagement? Number one, make it meaningful. Number two, foster that sense of competence in our students. Number three, provide autonomy support for the kids. Number four, embrace collaboration in your classroom. Number five, make those student-teacher relationships positive. And number six, promote mastery. It's not just about the grades. If you have other thoughts about increasing student engagement and maybe some strategies that you are trying in your classroom that are working or hey if something's not working let us know about that too because other people might be doing it and wondering why am I still doing this and I have no alternative or maybe they just need the validation to hear that it doesn't work from somebody else go to chrisnessy.com slash feedback and share your thoughts on student engagement Before I say goodbye for this episode, we have Just Give It a Try, and I've got the October question of the month, which we talked about through a couple episodes in September, and the question I put out to the House of Ed Tech community was, what collaboration tools are you and your students loving? And I got a great response from Stefan Troutman. Stefan says, quote, I think one of the best tools for collaboration is Padlet not only because it is a powerful cross-platform tool, but also because its flexibility allows students and teachers to collaborate in the process of learning rather than on the product. As an instructional technology coach, one of the most common questions I get is something about how to use technology to prevent students from cheating. My favorite, and I think the most appropriate approach, to this is not to use technology to put students in a secure box but rather to leverage the tech to open the world to students, to give them tasks that are impossible to cheat on because they are using technology to create a unique product and engage in authentic learning experiences. This is where Padlet comes in. The flexibility it provides through its various templates and variety of choices on how to upload and create content makes it a true playground for teachers and students to be able to do anything. Students can ask questions, share work, provide feedback, consume content, and create products all within Padlet. The only drawback is the paywall, but I have found teachers to be the most creative people on the planet when working within budgetary restrictions. Their ability to export content and material is a lifesaver for teachers who want to squeeze all the juice out of that free version of Padlet. End quote. Thank you, Stefan. Yes, Padlet is fantastic. I love Padlet. I don't like their paywall, but I love Padlet. And thank you, Stefan, for submitting 
your response to the October question. Now, here's the question for the month of November. What are you thankful for in life, in your career? Share your thoughts with me by Friday, October 29th, 2021, and I will include the responses that I get in episode 189, which is going to be released on November 7th. So I look forward to that. Go to chrisnessy.com slash feedback, and you can get those responses to me again by Friday, October 29th, 2021. Thanks for listening to episode 187 of the House of EdTech podcast. Special thanks to this episode's sponsor, eSpark Learning. Again, to learn more about eSpark, go to chrisnessy.com slash eSpark. Keep the conversation going. I shared a lot of things about student engagement in this episode, and I want to hear your thoughts. Go to the show notes page, chrisnessy.com slash 187 or chrisnessy.com slash feedback. If you enjoy the podcast, and hey, if you're listening this far, you enjoy the House of EdTech podcast, I thank you. And here's two things you can do to support the show. Number one, tell somebody else about the podcast. Share it on social media. Share it on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok. Get creative. Use the hashtag House of EdTech. Tag me at Mr. Nessie and share the House of Ed Tech with somebody who needs to listen to it or should listen to it. The other thing you can do, you could also become an awesome supporter. The awesome supporter program is powered by Patreon.com, which allows a consumer of content like you to support a creator like me. Special thanks to my awesome supporters, Anthony Arnaud from the STEM Class Podcast, Dan Gallagher. You can find his writings at Gallagher Tech. Dot edublogs.org. Carlos Garza, he hosts the Aced Tech Podcast. You can find Mr. G at Aced.tech. Thank you to Peggy George. She is at P George on Twitter. Jeff Herb. Find him on Twitter at Jeff Herb. Mike Messner. Find him on Twitter at Messner underscore Mike. Matt Miller from Ditch That Textbook. Go to ditchthattextbook.com. Thank you to J.P. Prezavento. He hosts the Bits and Bytes of Education podcast, and you can find everything he's doing on his website, jpprez.com. Thank you to Patty Reefus. She is at PGR Teaches on Twitter. Thank you to Lori Simpson at North L. Simpson. And of course, Kyle Wilcox. Thank you, Kyle. He is at, 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 <laughs> he is at Level Up Ed Tech on Twitter. Thank you to all of you, and there's always room for more people to support the show. Simply go to chrisnessy.com slash awesome. The next episode of the House of Ed Tech will be episode 188, and it's going to come your way on October 17th, 2021. Look forward to releasing that episode, continuing through the fall, and helping you on your ed tech journey. Until next time, thank you for learning with me, and remember... Using technology isn't difficult. Just give it a try.